This is a topic I think is evergreen and uh, super important. I mean, there's all of these great conversations about different technologies and uh, different techniques and, you know, that are all related to marketing, but without the right organizational design and culture, it's really hard to execute on those, and that is what we're going to cover in this session. So we have a uh, rock star panel uh, with us today. I'm really excited to introduce them. Uh, Martin Williamson, who's the chief marketing officer at Revlon, uh, Daria Burke, who's the ch uh, former chief marketing officer at Just Fab, Bob Sherwin, who's the chief marketing officer at Wayfair, Mark uh, Michael Scharf, who's the CEO of Evolve AI, and my friend Billy May, uh, who has an amazing career. He's been a CEO at Sir Latab. He was recently chief customer officer at J. Crew, uh, and has been uh, an amazing leader in the e-commerce industry for a long time. Uh, and he is going to moderate. He's kind of walked in everybody's shoes, so he's in a great position to kind of facilitate a great conversation. So, Billy, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I, I was asked earlier um, what's the best thing that I had seen so far in the conference, um, and I said other people's faces <laughs> because it's, it is a unique concept to be out and uh, interacting with everybody. So we have uh, an amazing uh, panel. Um, we've got a rich uh, agenda. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, each of them. Um, Scott uh, uh, covered uh, who I am, which I appreciate. Thank you, Scott. Um, to my left is Martine Williamson, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Revlon. She oversees the global strategic direction for their por portfolio of brands, including the iconic Revlon and Elizabeth brands, as well as smaller, more niche brands, including Aume, American Crew, and CND, to name a few. She started her career on the agency side, but uh, she spent the last 20 years in the beauty industry, and she has a deep passion for building brands, creating products, and fostering a collaborative and inclusive work environment. Next to her is Bob Sherwin. Uh, he's the Global Chief Marketing Officer at Wayfair. In his role, Bob is accountable for growing revenue and customer uh, loyalty for each of Wayfair's uh, offerings, including the All Modern, Birch Lane, Joss and Main, and Paragold, and the Wayfair brands. He joined Wayfair uh, back in 2013 when the company's revenue was $900 million, and today it's over $15 billion. Uh, next to Bob is uh, Daria Burke. Uh, Daria was most recently uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Jess Fab within the textile group, where she oversaw all marketing functions across channels and geographies. As part of her role, Daria was responsible for global brand awareness and positioning, as well as customer acquisition and retention, uh, and accountable for global membership growth and revenue for the brand. She was previously uh, head of beauty, fashion, and retail strategy at Facebook, and was one of 10 founding members of Rent the Runway. And last uh, is Michael Scharf. He's co-founder and CEO of Evolve AI whose platform enables organizations to optimize and personalize digital customer experiences and improve website performance. However, before migrating to the dark side on the vendor, uh, on the vendor uh, side, Michael spent 20 years in retail having served in senior digital leadership roles at Toys R Us, Staples, Best Buy, and Sears. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Um, we're going to talk about you know, a modern marketing organization for today's growth challenges. And the problem um, in today's environment is marketing often thinks of itself as the hub of the wheel, uh, working cross-functionally across an organization in different roles and different functions. And of course, uh, merchants feel that they're the hub of the wheel. And when business is great, as it has been in many companies, the merchants uh, are king. And when uh, the business is not so great, of course, it's marketing's fault. Um, so between that conduit of brand awareness uh, and, uh, and capturing uh, and creating a, a lasting customer relationship, um, different organizations organize and structure themselves uh, differently. Um, and so the functional responsibilities uh, differ depending on the organization. One might have creative and brand and media and PR and communications and not have the performance marketing side in another organization all of that lives under uh, marketing. Um, and still another organization, 
different features and functions may fit within uh, an IT uh, and an IT function. So uh, I'm going to start with Martine on, on how you guys think about marketing. Um, and most importantly, how has that changed over the last 18 months through what I'll call the great acceleration? So how do you guys think about marketing and how has that uh, thinking kind of changed or evolved? Marketing is the hub. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so we've been through a transformation at Revlon even pre-pandemic. But once the pandemic hit, the need to truly accelerate um, in digital and e-commerce had us accelerate in how we really uh, set up our organization. So we're a matrix organiz organization. We're highly cross-functional. But in order to really enable speed, we have um, enabled this agile pod where it's made of a smaller cross-functional unit where they're really driving the ownership of whatever that key initiative is that we want to move quickly on. And we empower them to work quickly kind of outside of any traditional processes. And we have escalation meetings so that we can have for very quick decision making. And not only has that allowed us to really truly accelerate, but it's empowered the organization because it's really giving ownership to the folks that are really doing the work. That's so great. that's been, I would say, the biggest change we've had at Revlon. Bob, what about uh, within Wayfair? Yeah, so um, the way we are structured is generally around each major channel. Like we consider each of those like a center of excellence and uh, treat them almost like an in-house agency where they're there and they have to support whether that's television advertising or direct mail, social, paid search, email. Each of those is led by a marketer who's really playing a role of a general manager and they need to support every market offering that we have. And their job is to some of the responsibilities fall directly under them and others are cross-functional. But regardless, like their job is to run the program day to day, right? Operate all the all the channel or the channels that fall under them, driving traffic and growth, but then really drive the strategy and the vision for the platform. And that may include bringing in engineering or data science teams um, or adjusting how we're approaching the on-site experience because that's a big part of their like prioritized agenda. And then we did that before, but I think during the um, pandemic, some of the things we realized we had to change with this model is just the uh, quality of communications and some of the processes by which those general manager marketers get alignment with all their cross-functional teams. Because there's a lot of competing priorities and you, know, you have less of the organic touch points that you had in the office. Yeah. Makes sense. Dara? A little bit of a hybrid, actually. So I had both brand and performance, and it enabled what I would call brand performance with my team, right? Our job is ultimately to be the voice of the brand to the customer and the voice of the customer back to the brand and to the business. And so it's very difficult to do that with silos. And so we didn't really change much of the org structure. Textile Fashion Group has a center of excellence that is an in-house media buying team, but outside of that acquisition strategy lives within the business. So it really came down to, and, and will continue to come down to demand, and what it is that we ultimately have to offer, how the membership might be evolving, and then where the customer is going. And so everyone understands that that is a team sport. And so whether your job is brand marketing, your site merchandising, your CRM, your PR and influencer marketing, even the creative director, everyone had a role in understanding the voice of the customer, and it was their responsibility to bring that back in partnership with their, their collaborative partners. Um, and, you know, and then I had a director of strategic initiatives who I could then have float as needed to sort of guest star in different pods or within other teams that didn't directly report into marketing. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, and I would add uh, to what Daria said, the most important thing is that the customer is at the center of all the activities and the organizational structure really doesn't matter as long as everybody's focused on the same outcomes and they understand that their role is part of a piece of trying to solve for customer needs. And um, I've worked in lots of different structures, all cross-functional to some degree, um, and none of them, I think, work better or worse than others as long as the entire management team's aligned around solving for customer needs first and foremost and understanding how your own individual metrics in whatever department you're in actually serve that greater purpose. Um, you know, we, we, we heard uh, earlier today Noam Peransky um, at, at Tapestry uh, as a chief digital officer. The conversation after ours is with Crocs between their chief marketing officer and their chief digital officer. Did, 
I, I don't know whether your organizations have that sort of construct between marketing a, a CMO and a chief digital officer, but how do you begin to think about um, those sorts of responsibilities in the past, maybe you know, uh, the site experience and the performance marketing. The other aspects might sit under a CDO or maybe a head of digital or otherwise. Uh, my experience has been uh, over the last couple of years and certainly through the great acceleration, that's moved I think much more to be core of marketing and developing the customer experience. So I, I, I Well, just to build on what Michael was saying, I, I think if we start with that, that core objective, that vision that everyone's working towards, and we set the KPIs and we know what the measurements for success are, then it's really about, from a marketing standpoint, setting out what we're trying to achieve and all of those experts within CRM, performance marketing, everyone else delivering, so we're going towards the end goal. Um, I think that is most critical across, you know, other than from a structural standpoint. Yeah, what I found is that what matters most is where you have the core expertise to actually execute on those yep. uh, areas. So whether it's in, in the e-commerce chief digital officer's role because they've built that technology and that capability in-house, or it's in the marketing org because you've got a really digital savvy CMO who understands that and is embedded data centricity as part of how they operate and the tools and the technology, it's, it's really core that the people with the expertise manage it, and it's not based on some you know, arbitrary hierarchical design. Right. Yep. Yeah, I think for us, I'll just chime in real quick. We're, we're digitally native, and so we're pure play e-com. So the way we've approached marketing from the get-go has been very data-driven. And so I think for us, we don't have a CDO role. And so really marketing does drive much of that agenda because we're sitting on the data. We're seeing how the site is performing, where it's falling down, where there's opportunity to really lean in and, and, and improve it. I would just quickly add, um, product has become more important as we've thought about how the overall strategic frameworks for going to market should work. I think in past lives, I've seen it sit on an island where it was really meant to just optimize certain parts of the site or the customer journey. And I think inviting them into the process and having them understand end to end what the goal is um, has really, you know, in our experience, enabled significant collaboration and much better outcomes in terms of the overall site performance. And when you say product, you mean the, the digital product? Yes, digital product, yes. Makes sense. So we, we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, definitional aspects of, of marketing and how that's evolved. I, Michael touched a little bit on organizational and how you begin to think about organization. And I, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to broach the topic of, as you think of, um, diversity, both in terms of, you know, the obvious definition of diversity, but also the less obvious might be creative, creative problem solving, some other aspects and how you value that. And, and most importantly, how do you think about those skills and where they fit in the organization or do you adapt the organization to meet uh, people's skills and how that, again, has evolved uh, through kind of the, the, the great acceleration. I'll, I'll start with, with Daria. Yeah, I think about diversity as both a process and an outcome. And therefore, I think you have to go into it with the idea that you're meant to serve and represent the customer base that you're, you want to attract or, or that you already have and reflecting that back. And so I think very much about it from the process of, you know, are we working with the right talent? Are we putting out the right messaging in the creative? Do I have the team to do that work and bring the strategic and personal point of view to it as well? And even that instinct to go follow the right data because they have a different point of view. Um, the outcome then becomes, right, that you have resonance in your ability to reach wide audiences or whatever that audience might be, and you can do that with authenticity. From a um, sort of cognitive diversity perspective, I'm a big fan of the Clifton Strengths tool. And I'll say that we think very much about bringing in the right people to complement the strengths that are prevalent and high and where you know things may be more rare. Where might you fill in a gap with new, new players? But I fundamentally believe if you play to the strengths of the team, you can still design to you know, the end in mind that you have. And, and I, as a leader, it's just how I think about sort of development and coaching and org structure at the same time. 
So Bob, if, if, if you needed to build out uh, a more balanced team, let's say, between the more analytical performance driven, um, you know, how do you adapt your organization? Certainly resources don't fall off trees. So how do you approach thinking about evolving the organization to, um, uh, to maybe think slightly differently? Yeah, so I agree with everything Darius said. I would say to answer your question, the way, the way I've seen it, it's been kind of like a journey where when I did join, we were very much performance-based, very low in the funnel, focused on search marketing. So it made sense that we were looking for really analytical people, um, kind of, and then gen they, that could play the role of a general athlete as well, working as technologists, mini data scientists, and then kind of general managers making a case to do something differently. Um, over the years, as we've moved up funnel and done a lot more there, um, it became very clear that we needed uh, more specialization and a more robust, like, kind of portfolio of team members, folks that did have kind of better just, like, consumer and brand instincts and, and knew how to build a brand and knew that e even if this ad is performing better, it just looks bad, right? Or it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's misleading and that's gonna, gonna drive the best like customer uh, affinity. Um, and so over the years, we've injected much more specialization, I'd say on the brand and creative side, but then even also on the technical side, uh, not just folks with good intrinsics that could learn the technical skills, but now we want people in certain roles where they're coming in with that experience. Right, with that, we're not gonna develop a data scientist, we wanna bring them in in certain roles and, and, and skip a few of the learning cycles. So I think we've evolved from generalists to probably more generalists are highly valuable still, but more specialists as well. Great, and Martine, as you, as you think about your organization, you've got many brands and a, and a broad scope. Are, are, there, are there functions that uh, maybe were under your pur purview or you think maybe should be under your purview because there's skills that um, in a matrix organization maybe you're trying to either supplement or, or require. How do you approach those sort of conversations with some of your internal partners? Well, the, the uniqueness about Revlon, different from, from these folks, is we do have a portfolio of brands, um, all very different brands meeting different consumer needs, all within beauty. Um, so there's different um, skill sets within the organization. And I think for those real you know, roles that require expertise, you need to hire um, those that are really diligent in driving that. But I also think from a community standpoint, talent comes from everywhere. Like there's, it could be any age, it can come from any department. So my career has been built off of, um, it for the most part, sitting into, fitting into roles that I had to create myself. So like paving the way. And I find that I look for people and try to create those opportunities where I see that they have the talent to do that. And that, again, further, um, I think, empowers them and really drives for development opportunities across all of the brands. Uh, I, I, one more thing I should say, yeah. according to, for, in regards to diversity, um, Revlon has always been about diversity from the get-go, from a consumer standpoint and, you know, meeting the needs from a product standpoint. But quite frankly, um, in the past, it was run by white men, <laughs> most often, you know. And so now I'm, you know, very proud to say that we have a leadership team that's 50% female and a diverse organization and a DNI council. And so it really um, is a proud place to be at these days because we've been on the forefront of that. That's great. And, and I think, um, you know, your, your point about uh, identifying uh, a, a, a talent or cultivating that um, <clears throat> and encouraging someone yeah. to pursue something is, is endemic within a a culture and um, and it drives a lot of change and and I think this notion of culture and purpose is one that certainly has moved to the fore in most conversations uh, through the pandemic. It's certainly a very heady topic and not the sole purview of marketing, but oftentimes organizations look to marketing to help shape that conversation. And so when you're thinking about culture. I like to think of it as, as the way things get done in an organization. And that can often, there can be inertia which works against you. And, and so how you evolve, um, how you evolve culture uh, is important. Um, and so each of you lead an organization and shape a culture for a team, either um, in what you'd like to see as an outcome or an area where 
you feel that there's opportunity. Michael, as a CEO running a business through a pandemic, um, how have you seen culture and purpose kind of um, shape the dialogue, the way you lead, and how you think about your organization? Yeah, there were, uh, one, it's been a really interesting time to try to shape and build a company. Uh, you know, we launched the company in spring of 2019, and it wasn't that much longer that, you know, we started to shelter in place and work from home, and it also overlapped with the Black Lives Matter movement in spring of last year. So we had a whole bunch of things going on that really helped shape our culture and how we think about it. And we did a lot to empower the organization to self-organize around uh, DNI initiatives and have really tried to embed that across the organization. And then we've been trying a lot of different things from a cultural standpoint in this new uh, you know, distributed environment where we try to stay engaged and try to empower people to communicate and engage in small groups and find ways to uh, build those relationships that you used to do in an office, which has been really challenging, to be honest. So I think it's, you know, we're excited to start being able to get back together in person, like we are here, uh, which is helping a lot with, you know, relationships. And I'm meeting four employees here that I've never met before uh, that have been working for me. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty exciting opportunity. That's great. Uh, Daria, what about culture and purpose, and uh, how do you make space for it? I mean, I think if you view your role as a reflection of the company back out to the world, I think it becomes easier to bring your values to the table. Part of my remit when I joined JustFab was to give the brand a new voice and a new visual signature. And so it meant and gave us an opportunity as a team to kind of clean slate a little. There was a lot there that we could take and we wanted to honor and bring forward, but we also got to just sit and ask ourselves, what do we believe in? What are our values at the individual level? What do our customers tell us that they love about us? And a lot of really cool work came out of that, one of them being this notion that, you know, shoes may not change the world, but the women who wear them will. And from that then became a number of initiatives where we got to elevate and highlight and celebrate women who we thought were culture changing and you know, leading with style, which became a series that we did featuring a lot of female founders. I think things like that um, are when they can come from an authentic place and you really believe, and I had an all-female leadership team at the time, that you know, it becomes really easy to live your purpose when you can bring that authenticity and that understanding that at the end of the day, we're still people in a business and, uh, and we are in a position through our business to reflect values that we think the broader world should understand, you know, and so that's true for social injustice, it's true for how we think about sustainability, it's true for, you know, being a voice and, and maybe just creating more awareness around issues that maybe haven't been as, you know, at the fore. So um, I think having the permission to do that culturally obviously is incredibly important. And I wanted my team to understand that, you know, when things went down, I mean, I would send them personal emails like, I don't know what to do either. I have a lot of personal feelings about what's happening as well. I'm scared too, you know, or this is hard for me too. Um, that vulnerability is, is powerful in unlocking people's willingness to step out and bring purpose to their work or find meaning in their work, right? We're not curing cancer, but you know, there's, there is meaning to be found in doing something that you find purposeful for someone else. That's great. Bob, how did, how did you make space uh, for culture and purpose within your organization? I mean, the, the space you guys occupy, the competitive space you occupy, super red hot through the pandemic, but clearly the topic of culture and, and yeah. purpose is critical, especially when you're on a growth trajectory you guys are on. Yeah, it's uh, critical based on the growth trajectory, but also just I think a lot of the shifts across society. And um, so it's top of mind for all of us. And we were very deliberate of carving out a lot of space for it. For DEI, both kind of corporate led by our HR group, but then within marketing, we set up a a team with some of my most senior leaders to, to focus on it, thinking about both the consumer and the in how we're going to market, because we have a unique set of levers in marketing, and then also within our organization. And so I think when we carved out a lane, multiple lanes for each of these, and for the consumer, I guess the biggest thing was we got really deliberate about 
how we want to um, think about our ad campaigns and the, uh, the talent we're choosing, making sure they're, we're a mass market brand for Wayfair and then we have a number of specialty brands. But for Wayfair, we wanted to make sure that this represents America, right? And, 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 and all, all the you know, beautiful types of people, uh, you know, and, and have, so that everyone could see themselves in our brand. And uh, making sure that we were you know, representing different folks but also not being stereotypical. Um, and all that, so we kind of created a set of rubrics there on how we're, and we're doing this now, we're leveraging this now, and I think we feel pretty proud of it. There's a lot more to come, and a lot more to do to refine it, but that was one on the consumer side, how we actually go to market with our ads and, and having that lens. And then internally, a lot of work just around ensuring that um, as we screen candidates, as we're interviewing them, as we're doing calibrations and review writing, that we're looking for biases in that and being really mindful of that and, and going through a lot of like learning and discussions and debates because I think generally people want to do better but they don't always know how. So I think we've taken an approach across a couple different angles. That's great. And then Martine, in a matrix organization, I mean, how do you ensure everyone's on the same page, has a similar lens that they're viewing the objective or more importantly, how you think about talent and culture internally, both within your organization and the organizations that support yours? Culture, yeah, it's so important. And as coming off of these last 18 months, it's never been more critical. We had a lot of kind of surveys and, and touch bases with our employees to get a read on how they were feeling. Prior to the pandemic, we were, you know, in the office five days a week um, around in all of our offices around the world. And so we really were concerned, of course, about the employees' physical well-being, but then it also became about their mental well-being and ensuring that we were, you know, being very thoughtful about how we were going to approach coming out of the pandemic and how we were going to change the ways of working. And so there's been a lot of, of subsets and groups about that. We've changed to a completely flexible work environment. There was a lot of angst for parents that were at home with their kids working and then the thought of like adding a commute back on. So we've completely revised how we're looking at the return to the office. And that has really created a culture of feeling that they're, they're cared for. Um, but everyone's excited to get back because we're all behind Zoom all the time. So there's like a really nice balance of I cannot wait to get back and be in person with meetings, but then to have the flexibility to, you know, take care of my family and myself. Sure. I think, you know, um, making the time and uh, it's, it's required for the job. I mean, your, your teams expect it as leaders, it's, it's expected. And so someone asked me like, you know, what comes off the list? The, the answer is, is it, it, it's injected into the list and it's, it's uh, you start with culture and, and oftentimes you end with, with culture. Now, all of you work within uh, organizations where you have matrix functions um, and you work cross-functionally, whether it's with uh, a finance organization or you're working with an IT organization or you've got HR partners, et cetera. How do you align your cross-functional partners towards a shared objective? H how do you go about aligning around a common KPI? Like, how do you get everybody on the same page in that regard? Bob? Sure. Um, I guess I try to keep it uh, simple and high level to start. Um, you know, I tend to lean on, where, you know, my, my role is to trying to maximize our active customer count. And, I, and the second objective is to maximize the share of wallet we're getting from them or lifetime value. And then from there, if everyone's going to nod their heads with that, then I'd share some of the priorities I see and how we can do that and what we want to do in marketing and the help we need from other teams that will drive growth on one of those two dimensions or both. Um, so I just try to keep it fairly simple up front to get the conversation going, build momentum, and then share with them the specific idea that we have that we want to go against. And I think the fact you, you guys work in, in these pods, cross-functional, you have somewhat of a shared objective. Is that is That's that right. Yeah, yes, for sure. And, and Michael, from a best practice standpoint, how, yeah, how, I would how's that feel? Say, you know, transparency and empathy are two really important factors. One is, you know, really sharing what's important to you and what your metrics are, but then listening, you know, really intently to your partners and trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish and then how you could find an intersection between those two. And I, I, I think that um, there's an element of, I'll call it compromise, 
Always. Uh, yeah. uh, whether Except in politics. Um, you know, marketing's priority is always, I'm sure, IT's number one priority, um, which is not. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, let's test. That's always yeah. a, a great answer is, is um, you know, you, you don't have to use the no playbook. It could be um, let, let's test. And to me, those sorts of uh, open-minded, you know, kind of approaches uh, help align team members towards at least a common goal. People don't feel like you're shutting them down in that regard. Um, we, we've got, you know, a, a limited amount of time. I, I, I thought it made sense to wrap up a little bit with a, uh, almost a, a stop and start. If you were sitting in the audience and, 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 and sitting through this conversation, what are the two things that you'd want an audience member to walk away from? What's one thing that you recommend that they stop and what's one thing that maybe they start um, as, you, as you think about um, imparting some wisdom, Martine? I would say stop doing things like you've always done it or think because we've done it in the past and it's been successful to do it again. Um, this has taught us test and learn. I am okay to be right-ish <laughs> as long because you learn from failure as much as you do or more so than success. So I would say start really you know, risk taking some risks and making some change and being, you know, thinking differently. That's great. Bob? Um, I would say stop trying to have the, the stage set or the table set perfectly for you from an organizational standpoint because it never will be. There's no perfect org model to do everything that we, as a marketer you want to do. So stop trying to do that and then start having like an ownership mindset and making sure your teams have that where they can work across uh, organizational boundaries through collab being collaborative, you know, using soft and hard techniques to influence and just get the job done, um, th whether it's through testing or, or, or whatever it is to get the ball rolling. It's great. Derek. I would say stop thinking you have to build it in a vacuum. I think it's so tempting to think that you've got to have the strategy and you own it and, and really um, start to think about how do you enroll others and for me the best way to do that do that is to just ask questions and I love going into a big meeting with a, a group of folks and saying how might we right and then you just approach all the things that you want to do because then people start raising their hands and and you know showing up with a lot of great ideas you never know where they'll come from love that Michael. and I would say uh, stop seeking perfection because it doesn't exist and Martine, uh, constantly experiment and innovate. The world's changing all the time and you have to change all the time to keep up with it. Love that. So the, the, the notion of, uh, of testing, the notion of curiosity I heard, um, the, the notion of uh, if there's opportunity, um, step forward, be proactive, uh, raise your hand. Um, I, I, I like to say that it, it's fine to complain, but uh, offer solutions um, and have a solution mindset. To me, that's uh, at its core what, what uh, makes up a, a modern organization. And so on, on behalf of the panel, I want to say thank you. Thank you to the panel. Uh, great, great insight, great conversation. And uh, lovely seeing everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.